<laughs> okay, well, thank you, Larry, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to you about really quite an exciting area of research that I stumbled across uh, in my lab. Uh, just a couple of years ago when I was working with Jennifer Locke. Uh, some of you may be uh, familiar with her work on the steroidogenesis area. And this work really stems from uh, the time that she spent in my lab and subsequent graduate students who have been working with me on, the, on this topic. So I'd like to wait if I can get this started. <laughs> So just the yeah. I'm going to start this morning by giving you a little bit of background as to what some of these terms mean. Exosomes probably doesn't mean a lot to many of you. So I'm going to introduce the topic first by introducing membrane-derived cellular vesicles, of which exosomes is a subset, and then to talk a little bit about cancer in exosomes and how exosomes have been historically um, researched as, as potential therapeutics, and go on to talk about some of the interesting work we've been able to complete at the, at the Vancouver Prostate Centre and areas of opportunity which open up in this, um, in this interesting domain. And so as many of you will be aware of the structure of the cell, it's a very fine-tuned um, uh, um, unit. It's the unit, uh, required functional unit of all life. Uh, its waste system, uh, uh, digestion, elimination is very uh, finely regulated, and this process is uh, mediated by the endosomal system. The endosomes are membrane-bound compartments found within cells. Typically, they're about 500 nanometers in diameter. They sort endocytose materials, so material that the cell no longer needs. Um, it's wanting to either secrete, eliminate, digest, recycle. And uh, typically, endosomes will be formed as part of an intracellular membrane budding process. And this process can occur, um, of course, continually in our, in our cells. Uh, digested excess or worn out organelles are essentially taken up into endosomes, which then somehow regulate or somehow recognize whether those, uh, those materials need to be uh, excreted, eliminated from the cell or recycled. Lysosomes merge with, exosome, uh, with endosomes, I'll get my zones right in a minute, endosomes um, to, um, which contain digestive enzymes and they, they facilitate this process of digesting materials for elimination into the cell. Exosomes in contrast, and so this process then results in this recycling of the garbage outside of the cell. Exosomes, in contrast, are membrane vesicles, which are formed in a very, very similar process by this intra, um, intralemmal plasma membrane budding. Um, however, they seem to be, they appear to be sorted in a quite regulated manner. They're membrane bound, they're secreted from all cells, they're secreted uh, more um, uh, elevated in malignancy in tumor cells. They're cup-shaped and typically quite a lot smaller than endosomes originating from the early endosome. You can see we've got a nice image here using t uh, transmission electron microscopy. On the right-hand side, I've got a contrast vesicle here, from some of what you which may have, have heard of, and that is the prostosomes. Prostosomes are really quite different entities. They're microvesicles, they're found in urine and semen, and they're responsible for providing the nutrient content to, um, to sperm to uh, provide nutrition for motility and function of sperm. They're really quite different vesicles to those um, of the, ex the exosomes. So I'll be focusing on exosomes um, from here on in. Exosomes gained a lot of notoriety as membrane vesicles conveyors of immune response. And in the last 10 years, we've seen a large literature base um, prevail on their role as conveyors of immune response. Their tumor-derived exosomes have immune suppressive properties. They're able to essentially line or coat or, um, the surface of tumor cells and inhibit T cell processes, which would normally allow the body to uh, rapidly and efficiently uh, eliminate tumor cells. However, they reduce the capacity of natural killer cells, the production of T cells. They induce um, uh, generation of myeloid-derived uh, suppressor cells and culminate in tumor-derived exosomes, which seem to subvert anti-tumor um, immune response. 
So this property of exosomes has been capitalized on as potential therapeutics. Exosomes are, um, are units which have the capacity to be antigen presenting and so therefore used in immunotherapy. Uh, they're therefore a source of exogenous antigens. Tumor cells have been purified from <coughs> cultured cells in, in vitro and um, essentially programmed to present um, antigens specific to uh, cancer. So in malignancies such as uh, advanced <coughs> melanoma, small cell uh, lung cancer, um, dendritic cells in the presence of uh, exosomes or epithelial growth factor receptor presenting exosomes, carcinoembryonic uh, carcino antigen and other recognizable factors, melanoma antigen recognized by T cells. These factors can be presented on the surface as exosomes that which are then exposed to dendritic cells which go on to um, recognize these factors in tumors, um, tumor cells providing a basis for immune therapy. Some of the early side effects which have been recognized in phase one studies, two phase one studies have compl been completed to date, are really quite mild and involve a localized reaction site of injection, mild fever, um, immunogenic properties of dendritic cell derived and, and uh, exosomes in vivo. Um, and, and in cancer models, in, in animal models, have shown that uh, mice with established tumors can, uh, in fact, reject tumors when injected with, with exosomes. There are limitations of dendritic uh, cell-based therapies, which I've listed here. However, uh, one of the main uh, pushes in this area really has been in preparing um, clinical-grade exosomes for delivery. And um, immunotherapy is, is a really quite an avid area of research, certainly in prostate cancer currently. I'm not going to talk to you today about immunotherapy, though it's really not my background. I'm a pharmacologist. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about therapeutic targeting and the use of exosomes. <coughs> so the research in my lab on exosomes as uh, potential therapeutic targets, but also as uh, potential um, enriched vesicles uh, presenting biomarkers and the potential of having a biomarker-rich entity present in a non-invasive um, uh, serum, urine, samples which we can easily and rapidly access. And so this has really been the area where uh, my lab has inquired into the, uh, into the exosome world. I've summarized here a large literature base now has been generated in exosomes. Not only, I'm going to try and use my pointer here, not only in the area of immune response, which uh, can subsequently produce a pro-inflammatory um, uh, system, but also in this role as a potential cell-cell communication vesicles. And this really has emerged as a property which has been explored in the cancer domain, as a, an area where uh, cells can communicate in the absence of immediate um, uh, direct uh, uh, interaction, but via these little, what, I, what I've termed, and certainly uh, in previous uh, trying to convince others of this entity and the, of the rationale of, of why we're doing this, they're like little life rafts that the cancer cell is emitting, sending out to signal to other cells surrounding that they are, uh, they want to enhance this pro-survival capacity um, in the local tumor microenvironment. And so it's really tumor microenvironment biology. Uh, Exosomes have been shown to promote effects on tumor and stromal remodeling by enhancing the capacity of surrounding cells to um, uh, essentially lose their adhesive properties. Uh, they promote uh, neoangiogenesis by enhancing VEGF and other factors involved in angiogenesis, but also thought to be involved in, have a role in autocrine signals to distant tumor cells, essentially uh, creating a, um, an environment which is um, inviting to, for tumor cells to migrate and metastasize to. In the, in the case of prostate cancer, that would be primarily the bone. And so not only are we seeing um, a, a function of, of our endosomes in producing um, uh, elimination vesicles, a, a, a garbage or recycling process, but also these exosomes, which are essentially formed from early endosomes, and we believe may be enhancing or have a, a significant role in the progression uh, of prostate cancer, but also cancer in general. And really, I'm focusing here on prostate cancer because we live and breathe prostate at the, uh, at the prostate center, but it really is applicable in the broad sense to other cancers, many cancers. 
So a little bit more detail on how exosomes are formed. As I mentioned, we see this intralamal plasma membrane budding to form early endosomes. So essentially the membrane is flipped inside out and these early endosomes are formed. The phosphatidylserine um, is presenting on the inside in this case. They go on to create these multi multivesicular bodies and what happens is these membranous <coughs> bodies, the early endosomes, then uh, bud themselves and so they flip inside out again. So we create these little vesicles, the micro uh, vesicles, exosomes, which now have the phos phosphatol ser uh, serine presenting on the outside, similar to our cells. And so they have all of the regular um, surface, cell, uh, surface cell molecules, antigens present on the outside, very similar to our cells. You can see a nice crop of exosomes here being formed. So I've characterized the physical chemical properties of different secreted vesicles and how we can actually um, distinguish exosomes from others. Uh, it's really a size exclusion phenomenon that we uh, capitalize on and we also use uh, density and sucrose to isolate these entities in, uh, in our lab and cell culture. Um, we're doing a series of sucrose-based ultracentrifugations. This is very simple. We've, there are also various kits that you can buy commercially now uh, to, uh, to enrich your sample uh, preparation. Uh, we started in, in the lab, we started isolating exosomes before kits were available, so we actually did it the, 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 uh, uh, the conventional way. Um, as I mentioned, exosomes, we believe, are really quite highly uh, regulated and sorted in terms of their cargo. Uh, this, is, this has essentially been shown. The escort or endosomal yeah. sorting complex required for transport, TSG 101 systems, are known to be involved in regulating the sorting of protein, uh, sorting of the content of exosomes that are being formed by the cell. And it's for this reason that re really people started to believe that exosomes weren't a waste disposal truck, that they weren't really, you know, they weren't a cellular process uh, that many have argued they are in simple waste elimination or recycling of material from the cell, that they do have a function that's very direct and specific in cell-cell communication. They've now been shown to confer changes in surrounding cells via transfer of their cargo. Specific cargo has been tracked and traced and monitored uh, through to recipient cells. Not so much in prostate cancer or the cancer world, but uh, certainly in immunology. So this is where I really got quite excited because I thought, well, this is an area where I can really make an impression and look at what's happening with prostate cancer and cancer in general. They contain, they don't contain um, uh, nuclear material, they don't, there's no DNA, and so the only genetic material that has been found in exosomes is mRNA, microRNAs, and many of you will be familiar with now, um, proteins and lipids. Um, transfers of exosomes in cancer research has been shown to convert a cell survival advantage and it's this area that really we've been really quite keenly interested in. Um, they transfer cell signaling hubs and so the microvesicles are very rich in lipids. We've done lipid analysis, I'll go on to show you, but they actually contain um, uh, very rich lipid um, hubs known as lipid raft micro uh, domains. And these are sections of the uh, cell membrane where, um, for example, SARC family uh, uh, kinases will, emer will um, migrate and many of the cell signaling processes will concentrate and actually functionally um, go on to signal through the cell from, um, which is really quite an interesting area because uh, many of these will contain caviolin 1, which is responsible for many uh, signaling processes mediated mediating AKT, um, conferring a cell survival advantage. CAV1 also has been a potential uh, biomark in prostate cancer. So in my lab then, I wanted to focus on cell-cell <coughs> communication. Uh, we previously discovered serendipitously, and this is how my lab got to be interested in this topic, that cytochrome P450 CYP17, uh, which many of you may remember, De Bono was talking, probably was talking about last week, I wasn't here at the rounds, but Certainly, uh, with abiraterone targeting CYP17 stereogenesis process, um, a very hot to uh, target currently uh, in uh, the area of stereogenesis inhibitor. We discovered CYP17 in exosomes derived from serin in prostate cancer and compared um, the presence of those of, uh, of CYP17 uh, with normals and showed that we did see elevated CYP17 in prostate cancer patients. 
Uh, we've gone on to do protein characterization of exosomes derived from uh, a panel of prostate cancer cells as compared with a normal benign cell. And uh, with the, with in, the, the, uh, um, the goal being to provide insight into therapeutic targeting and biomarker discovery. And so I'll launch into a little bit of the data that, that, uh, that we, uh, we have uh, prepared and published here. Back in 2008, when Jennifer Locke was working in my lab, she, really, she conducted a series of, of really quite eloquent studies looking at stereogenesis and the phenomenon of de novo intracrine stereogenesis in the prostate, demonstrating that upon removal of, of androgens, the cells themselves, the cancer cells themselves, um, essentially uh, upregulate their own machine, the, the machinery required to synthesize their own steroids in the cells in the tumors. And uh, this resulted in a series of publications that comprised her uh, PhD thesis. And um, what we were able to demonstrate was that amongst uh, many of the steroidogenic enzymes, CYP17 is upregulated, that it, it is presented in, uh, it, it's present in uh, tumor cells, um, it's upregulated during castration-resistant progression, and that uh, using our uh, analytical pharmacology core, uh, which many of you may remember the last time I spoke, I talked about the mass spec units, the mass spec facility we have at the Prostate Center. Well, this is one application that we used and really quite successfully demonstrated androgen synthesis in uh, tumor cells. So focusing on CYP17, um, we were able to show that uh, CYP17 has a, a secretory profile in prostate tissue, and this really sparked my interest because this was quite similar to PSA. CYP17 is a steroidogenic enzyme. Why would it have a secretory profile? Um, so we went on to look at serum derived from normal uh, controls in prostate cancer patients, and this is where we saw this elevation in CYP17. Just as a rehash, CYP17 converts progesterone through to downstream androstein diomes via a two-step process. And it's, it's fundamentally required for the steroidogenesis process. If you cut out that enzyme, steroids simply can't. It's thought that they simply can't um, uh, proceed through the steroidogenesis pathway through to androgen synthesis. And so what we, what we were seeing and, and subsequently validated was that we had uh, CYP17 in serum exosomes. Um, we sought, we looked into exosomes because rationally, um, I couldn't really fathom why CYP17 would be um, intact, available in the serum, unprotected. And so I looked into the literature, found that there were microvesicles that contained protein and that perhaps these were in fact protecting CYP17 in the serum um, as it, it, uh, it is um, uh, being secreted. We did, a, we did an exosomal isolation. We found that we were enriching for CYP17. We then went on to isolate or identify other cytochrome P450 oxidoreductase and other factors required for the, uh, the function of this enzyme. And uh, we're able to quite nicely show that all were available and present in, in exosomes. And felt that this really could be a, quite a useful pharmacodynamic readout of CYP17, particularly um, with, uh, considering current um, resistance mechanisms associated with what de Bono was talking about, an abiraterone resistance and upregulation of steroidogenesis enzymes, upregulation of CYP17. Um, if we can, in fact, monitor that in the serum and not really rely on uh, looking at arrays of steroids, we can look directly at the mechanism of, um, of resistance in the serum. This is a very useful biomarker which can be prognostic for, for the development of acquired resistance to um, steroidogenesis inhibitors such as CYP17. So in a nutshell then what, what we've essentially shown is that um, we can use, we can track CYP17 or we can track proteins in serum exosomes and if these are subsequently upregulated as part of a resistance mechanism, as part of a um, a prognostic evaluation factor, um, we can look at how they may be enriched in serum and um, that this mechanism may in fact be part of a, um, a cell survival or pro-survival mechanism that tumors are um, developing to try to overcome blockade of, of, or targeting of specific systems such as CYP17. So we've gone on to isolate and characterize exosomes from a panel of prostate cancer cell lines. Uh, in the literature, we were able to find that 
um, exosomes have been routinely isolated from other systems, not necessarily in the prostate, not in prostate cancer cells, and so this was really a novel area. We wanted to do this so that we could um, map out the, 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 proteo the proteomic um, System or the, what the proteins present in exosomes, which have the, present, the, the potential for being delivered to surrounding cells, which have the potential for um, being identified as potential uh, diagnostic biomarkers. We were able to show that or find that in three hours, we could, uh, the exosomes are really quite nicely produced. This has been uh, validated now. And um, by a series of using a series of centrifugational sucrose differentiated. Um, uh, lab techniques, we've come up with this really quite nice uh, series of, of pictures uh, determined using transmission electron microscopy. You can see here the uh, characteristic cup shape of uh, exosomes here. These, these are derived from PC3 cells. We've looked at androgen receptor uh, positive and negative prostate cancer cells here and trying to discern any differences in proteins found within the two. Um, and we've compared and contrasted this with uh, those from a benign cell line, RWPE1s. We have characteristic proteins known to be found in exosomes, which we screen for in all of the exosome purification, sam purified samples that we have, and we've been able to show that many um, uh, heat shock proteins, tubulin, RAP5, uh, tetraspanins, are in fact found in our purified samples, so uh, essentially provide validation that we have purified what we think we have. Interestingly, in the literature, in two-dimensional <coughs> images derived from uh, cells, uh, exosomes derived from cells, um, others have shown that uh, these cup-shaped vesicles do in fact have uh, internal substructures and that there are exosomes within exosomes. Uh, we don't have the technology to do this currently here, but I thought I would show you that the, it's not quite as simple as what you see on the surface. There are subcellular vesicles found within exosomes. And we've gone on to analyze our exosomes for uh, lipid and cholesterol content to see if there's any difference between the cancer cell-derived exosomes as compared with the normal benign and um, and really see if there are distinguishing factors that we can uh, <coughs> discern from our uh, using our analytical core. We've been able to show that RWP1 cells seem to have a much reduced or uh, lower cholesterol content than do the exosomes, um, sorry, reverse. These are the exosomes in red. The exosomes have much higher cholesterol content um, than their, their respective cells. And so um, perhaps a mechanism of, of cholesterol transport also in this, in, this, uh, in this sense. We've gone on to look at uh, glycerolipid and glycerophospholipid content. We can see that we're seeing um, consistently lower glycerolipid content in our exosomes compared to all cell lysis. There doesn't seem to be a distinguishing factor here as there was with cholesterol with the normal cells versus precancer cells. And here, the sphingolipid content, significant difference, an elevation of exosome of sphingolipids in exosomes as compared to, to cell lysates. And um, this really does quite mirror quite nicely what's been uh, seen in the literature also. And so having characterized, purified, uh, have a sample now of exosomes derived from each of these cell lines, um, phenotypic features of which we're very well familiar with at the prostate center. And so, uh, really a good starting point for mapping known proteins, known singling pathways which could be uh, subsequently transmitted or communicated to surrounding cells, uh, we felt that we uh, should carry out a, a screen for uh, diagnostic biomarkers in each of these cell types and see how each one uh, might compare with others which have different phenotypic characteristics and as they compare with normal or the benign um, cell line, the RWP ones. So Elham Hosseini Beheshti in my lab uh, designed this really quite eloquent set of experiments or series of experiments to do exactly that. She cultured the PC3, D145, link up VCAP and RWP1 cells. And I think I'm missing one, never C42 derived from the link up cell. 
and isolated the exosomes, uh, subjected those to QTOF mass spec analysis in my lab where we did protein profiling of all of the <coughs> peptides, all of the, using peptide sequence matching uh, with known databases. We were able to um, come up with uh, lists of proteins um, that we believe are found in each of these um, uh, vesicular bodies derived from each of the cell types. What we've been able to do now is uh, we've submitted uh, this piece of, uh, of research to uh, molecular and cellular proteomics for publication. We just recently submitted a draft. <laughs> we've been able to f characterize the proteins that we found within exosomes from each of the cell types uh, functionally and so uh, determine which are involved in, for example, uh, tissue development, cell death processes, cellular growth and proliferation, <coughs> and so on. We used ingenuity characterization, which is software typically used for gene expression profiling and characterizing groups of genes associated with different cellular functions. Uh, we went on to um, demonstrate the mutuality of uh, proteins. And so just to give you a rough example, between two and 300 proteins found within uh, exosomes derived from each of the, the, the cell types. And so we've been able to um, do uh, data management using a lot of the uh, characterization, a lot of the software that we have in-house for dealing with genes. Um, this being on somewhat of a smaller scale. And so we've been able to demonstrate the mutuality of proteins found within each of the, um, let me just go back a sec each of the cell types and um, we've characterized them or classified them here according to uh, the expression of androgen receptor and so the androgen sensitivity of those cell types here and determined um, a number of, of really quite interesting potential uh, leads in terms of biomarker presentation. Uh, we do have a patent submitted currently so I don't have those lists for you unfortunately but I do have a list of biomarkers which we've been shown to be present uh, demonstrating the enrichment process that occurs in exosomes in, pro in providing um, a sample for uh, potential biomarker use for biomarker analysis or biomarker validation moving forward. And this is a list of biomarkers which have been shown to be used or which are currently being um, evaluated for potential biomarkers in these specific diseases. And uh, we've been able to statistically uh, verify that. Um, the chance of finding these biomarks in the serum um, uh, in exosomes is, uh, is by far uh, enriched as a sample uh, in, in presenting the, uh, this um, opportunity. So moving into exosome function then and the, the uh, idea that we may have uh, be able to use these as therapeutic targets, uh, we, uh, it's been uh, reproducibly re uh, shown uh, by others that communication between cells without this direct cell-cell contact can occur via exosomes um, in other cell systems, but mainly in the immunological research domain. Um, recipient cells, as I mentioned, acquire new properties upon exposure to exosomes from other cell types, and that there is this exchange in material between cells, cell types. Um, this idea, and really, you know, having stumbled across this area, <coughs> having no insight previously, uh, really get, certainly got me thinking and chatting to others in uh, the area of cancer research. Uh, when we th consider prostate cancer as a heterogeneous disease, we have multifocal, it's a multifocal disease. It's not just, a, you know, we don't see a single um, area of tumor growth. We see multiple sites. This could really be an explanation into how that may happen in that we see a, a foci of cancer develop and then exosomes derived from that foci of cancer essentially migrate through the local tumor microenvironment into the local, into the cell population surrounding which are normal and by this communication mechanism just deregulate or causes missed signaling to, to start which can then as we know develop and, and in turn uh, produce a cancer phenotype and so I, re I found this this, this phenomenon really quite interesting and uh, I felt that it, it may provide some insight into how that process happens um, as a therapeutic target. If we can, we, we know that exosomes are produced um, in more abundance in tumor cells than in normal cells. So if we can somehow target this process, we may be able to slow down this uh, 
migratory process or this local invasion that uh, we believe could be happening. Uh, unfortunately, I feel that this also suggests that no uh, uh, primary tumor is in fact uh, non-metastatic and that, that once a tumor is formed that, um, uh, you know, that, that I think that uh, these systems are more clever than we believe and then removing a single tumor site may not be as simple as we believe and that exosomes will still be present or still have actually communicated locally. But uh, that, I think, is really uh, philosophy. Um, so in terms of using these entities as uh, specific therapeutic targets, um, as I've mentioned, it's been shown that lipid rafts associated protein sorting occurs in formation of exosomes. And um, in this instance, I'm using an example of a SARC tyrosine kinase, which is associated with lipid rafts, which has been studied <coughs> intensely by one of our newer researchers in the lab, uh, Dr. Amina Zubaydi, and uh, who have been uh, collaborating with recently um, in perhaps uh, looking at some of the cell signaling processes which could be uh, conveyed, messages could be conveyed locally to surrounding cells to shift um, uh, response or the way that uh, the phenotype shifts in uh, cells exposed to exosomes. Link kinase I've shown here, this is a publication uh, coming out of the Vidal lab and, and this uh, really quite eloquently shows that exosomes are rich for lin kinase. Um, Amina went on to explain to me that in fact lin kinase is exocytose to the plasma membrane and this is via a signaling process or rather a tagging process um, known as palmitoylation. Um, it's been previously reported the ubiquitination has been the tagging process for cargo sorting in exosomes. In this case this may uh, in fact uh, direct exosomes to other recognition factors such as palmitoylation. And so uh, it's been really intriguing to look at the prospect of potentially looking at link kinase alongside other SARC tyrosine kinases and other cell signaling processes that could be conveyed uh, as m in messages uh, via exosomes. And so this is a piece of data that Amina developed which um, essentially shows the upregulation of lin uh, tyrosine kinase during prostate cancer progression and that uh, she's really quite nicely showed that lin kinase can uh, hypersensitize androgen receptor um, to um, signal in the absence of uh, steroids, in the absence of testosterone. So considering the molecular composition of exosomes, then we're looking at lipids, uh, cholesterols, sphingolipids, we're considering lipid RAS being uh, uh, conveyed in terms of enriched in surrounding cells via exosomal communication, mRNA and microRNA, um, discrete packages of genetic material that we believe can be conveyed, which has been shown, can be transferred to surrounding cells in a, in a local environment. Um, and of course, we focused on protein composition. And I've summarized uh, here, I've actually taken this from Terry et al. in a Nature Review article, whereby the different classes of proteins which are found in exosomes have been uh, summarized. We can see we've got transmembrane molecules, <coughs> lipid raft, rich areas, adhesion molecules, signaling molecules, um, all of which are um, can be presented to surrounding cells by a receptor recognition sites on the surface. What we really wanted to know was whether or not um, the proteins are en emptied out into local cells upon fusion and whether or not, and we wanted to visualize this transfer for ourselves in the lab in a prostate cancer uh, cell line system. And so that's some of the data I'm going to show you now, which is is really quite intriguing. Um, we isolated exosomes from the six cell lines, as I previously mentioned. And um, in fact, once we determined which, uh, which cell line gave us the best crop of exosomes, we decided to select that one, take a, a, a rich source of exosomes, and expose other cell lines, non-identical cell lines, to these, this crop of exosomes. We use DE145 cells, non-androgen receptor expressing. I might add that the androgen receptor itself is not present in exosomes. Nobody's be able to show that. And we've exposed the non-identical cell lines to exosomes derived from DE145 cells. And I don't know if we want to dim the lights a little bit here. Let's show uh, the right one. 
we can <coughs> see that we're using cell tracker here. The red stain is cell tracker. It's, it's staining the membranes of the exosomes. And so we're seeing this coalescence of exo exosomes, or the membranes of exosomes, around this DAPI stain nucleus of the different cell types. And uh, this, these are the three-dimensional images on the bottom, and these are the 2D on the top. We can see that there is a coalescence of membranes. However, the question still remained, are exosomal proteins transferred um, in addition to this coalescence of membranes? We might assume by the laws of physics that you would see coalescence of lipid-like structures, and so that could just be a chance occurrence that lipids just basically glob onto the cell membranes being lipid also and it's just uh, the laws of physics allowing that phenomenon to occur. <coughs> so we wanted to try to find um, essentially an exosome protein marker and uh, something that we could really um, get excited about, think, uh, look at, at the um, uh, potential for targeting this in exosomes and um, as chance would have it, by luck we found clostrin and HSP27, co-chaperones, <laughs> um, previously uh, thought to be, known to be, in large millimolar quantities in serum. And um, other scientists, of course, this is a project, uh, the clostrin and HSP27 targeting um, strategy in prostate cancer has been uh, developed quite uh, rapidly by uh, Dr. Gleave. Um, HSP27 focused by uh, Dr. Zubedi, in, uh, formerly in his lab, and, and this is um, you know, something where we have developed targeted therapeutics, our antisense uh, in phase three clinical trials now show and uh, demonstrated a benefit in um, uh, extending life in prostate cancer patients when combined with chemotherapy and other uh, targeting agents. Um, Discussions in our lab group around the round, the round table discussion with other scientists have always been, well, why is clustering such high concentrations in the serum? What is it doing there? We know there are many, numerous functions uh, shown uh, by clustering uh, to have pro-survival uh, properties. This is why it's a good target for prostate cancer. Um, but what is it doing there? And uh, uh, there was a, tra a train of thought suggesting that it, because it's such a, a massive molecule that it's in fact wrapping itself around other proteins and uh, I felt that this could be a protective mechanism, a protein protective mechanism. When we stumbled across this in our protein profiling uh, we noticed that there were massive amounts of clustering in exosomes as compared to other proteins, um, other chaperones. So we looked at uh, clustering as a potential for being an exosome marker. We isolated our uh, exosomes uh, from both, um, these are PC3 cells, and uh, we isolated exosomes from PC3 cells intact, and those which have been targeted uh, via knockdown strategies such as siRNA directed towards clustering. We also looked at HSP27, and we saw that clustering, uh, when we knock down clustering in cells, we may actually be manipulating um, exosome formation. This is still to be validated. And um, we can see that when we effectively knock down clustering formation in cell lysate, we always see the pre presence of clustering in exosomes. And so while siRNA technology is good, it's not that good. And there's always remaining protein following knockdown. And so any remaining pro protein that we see, we believe is uh, required or is, is certainly present in exosomes. So we decided to focus on clustering because this molecule is very well understood, um, not necessarily within the exosome domain, but for use as a protein, as a, 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 an exosome marker, so that we could monitor this protein and uh, essentially visualize <coughs> the transfer of uh, material intracellularly. We've been able to tag or rather Nar Lee in Dr. Gleave and Zubedi Labs has been able to tag the clustering molecule with a green fluorescent protein. And so we've used uh, this um, uh, green fluorescent protein expressing LINCAP cells in this case. And we uh, exposed them, I'm going to turn the lights off again here. We exposed those cells, our exosomes derived from GFP clue tagged overexpressing cells to um, 
identical and non-identical cells. So we expose them to the link cap cells, we expose them to PC3 cells, and then the normal order P1 cells. And I don't know if you can make this out, but there are small green flecks uh, being uh, transported intracellularly. We do still see globs of this material on the outside, just basically, we believe, stuck to the cell membrane still, but we do see penetrance of, of the protein uh, inside the cells. And so uh, to us, this is really quite an exciting piece of data because it demonstrated that the exosomes that we were uh, mapping not only stuck to the sides of recipient cells in the local tumor microenvironment, but they did actually transfer proteins into surrounding cells. And in this case, clustering, a pro-survival protein that we could track. And so we'll uh, move forward using clustering as our, our uh, validation marker for uh, for exosomal uh, content transfer. So working hypothesis moving forward then in this work, um, exosomes have a pivotal role in cell-cell communication. That's been shown in other areas of research, not necessarily in prostate cancer. Um, they've been shown in the local tumor microenvironment to confer activation of numerous cell survival processes. Um, and uh, we believe that they these processes contribute to the progression of prostate cancer, but also as sentinels of therapeutic resistance. And so we believe that there may be a use for um, uh, serum exosomes, urine exosomes, um, non-invasive tests, essentially uh, biomaterials that we can acquire. Uh, every cell in the body produces exosomes. And so if we can purify exosomes and uh, essentially um, um, isolate them according to their um, tissue of origin, which uh, certainly me methodology is under development to do that, we can hopefully uh, use these vesicles as a source of enrichment of biomarkers uh, for these processes. Um, essentially what we're trying to do now is determine uh, the phenotypic change that would occur in, in uh, cells recipient to uh, exosomes derived from prostate cancer cells. So we're looking at our normal cells. We're exposing them to exosomes derived from all of the different cell types. They are expressing, not expressing uh, cell lines with different uh, phenotypes. Then we're doing <coughs> protein profiling to see, and gene arrays, in fact, to see um, how transcriptomes change and how proteins change upon exposure to these microvesicles. Uh, we're also looking at the effect of uh, chemo stress and sterogenesis inhibitors and uh, androgen receptor targeting uh, drugs um, to cellular response in producing exosomes and how those protein profiles shift in response to treatment with drugs uh, so that we can essentially determine whether drugs, uh, whether we can use exosomes as a marker for uh, for example, resistance mechanisms such as the overexpression of CYP17 in response to abiraterone resistance. So for future work, we want to validate the in vitro protein profiling work. So we're uh, getting access to some serum via Kim Chi, Anthony Joshua, U of T, uh, Martin Gleed. Um, we're looking at uh, material which has been from patients which have been both treated and non-treated and uh, using them to carry out a diagnostic following sample uh, enrichment. Uh, so basically taking exosomes from serum and trying to um, analyze, analyze them in subsets and so purify them using chromatography based on uh, recognition markers such as FOLH1, which is known to be defined from prostate, derived from prostate cancer, um, and other recognition markers uh, which we can essentially create or isolate exosomes from the serum which have been which are derived from prostate. Uh, all cells produce exosomes and so you can imagine there's quite a soup of exosomes present in the serum. We want to try and just look at those which are derived from prostate and see what protein profiles that we're seeing in those in response to treatment. Uh, with various targeting agents. Obviously, we're interested in abiraterone, which shuts down CYP17, but also now OGX011, clustering targeting, um, as well as general chemo stress, or taxotere, um, and so on. And we'll be um, subjecting our samples to QTOP analysis using mass spectrometry. 
and essentially developing a series of uh, protein profiles for comparison um, to determine whether biomarkers that we believe may play a role in uh, prostate cancer prognosis, uh, determinants of prostate cancer progression and, and uh, resistance to uh, therapy uh, can be determined from, this exos from exosomes as a rich milieu. And so with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. So uh, primarily, Elham Hosseini Bezheshti has conducted all of the research on exosomes in my lab. Hans Adamat conducted all the mass spectrometry. Jen Locke found exosomes in the serum originally in the CYP17. And so uh, it was uh, such a pleasure to work with Jen. She's now a medical student at the University of Toronto. I was still in touch publishing papers together. And so uh, it's that kind of graduate student that really is, is uh, the gem that we all uh, wish and pray to have. Stephen Pham has now taken some forward some of the proteomic work, and uh, Amina um, <coughs> Nali, who generated GFP tag, um, Ladan, ooh, Ladan, who's our resident pathologist, who did all of the CYP17 staining, Martin, Kim Chi, Anthony Joshua, who are now helping me move forward in the serum analysis phase of this work, um, as well as others who provide antibodies, and the transmission electron microscopy facility at UBC. He really opened the doors to us to do a lot of this exciting work. So thanks very much, and uh, hopefully uh, I've been able to provide some interesting insight into a relatively new area of research in my lab. Any questions?